I'd love to know what you think of my ZF theories and why it is the ultimate Nikon Trojan horse. G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope you are super well. I am so excited to talk about the arrival of the ZF. Such an exciting day today and so many people will be getting their ZF around the world as we speak along with the 135 1.8 Plenar two very exciting products and from my perspective both of them are actually telling us a lot about Nikon's strategy a lot about the future and this thing here well I call it the Trojan horse and that is what this video is going to be about plus cool it's just it's, it's just cool it is it's just it's just hot Alrighty, let's talk about why this is the Trojan horse in Nikon's arsenal. And it's about the broad appeal of this camera. And it starts with the fact that, well, it's cool. It's inspired by the FM. It's inspired by the FM2. If you fold your screen away like this, there's not a lot on this camera that lets you know that this is a modern day camera there's not very much here at all. Now, of course, if you do this and do this, that does change the equation, but you don't need to do that. And that is just the very first reason why this is a Trojan horse. It really does look like an absolutely retro camera. You've got two retro special edition lenses that you can snap on the front here. We've got the 28 and we've got the 40. Either option's a good option. These are light and they're affordable, or you can go with the kit. And there it is, stealth. And this camera, and depending on which of the six colors and black you go for, this camera will absolutely fit in anywhere. How good will it look on a wedding shoot? How good will it look if you're a vlogger or a blogger? How good will it look if you're just out at a party, out with the family, down at the beach, or if you're on holidays? And you can do photojournalism with this camera and you can just go with the standard black stealth edition and you're going to look fantastic. You are going to look the part. But this is just the beginning of why this is a Trojan horse in Nikon's strategy. So it looks the part. It can go anywhere. It can be anywhere. It can fit in anywhere. But it's a technological powerhouse to boot. It's packing XP7. It's packing the best IBIS unit that we've ever seen from Nikon. It's packing pixel shift, giving us 96 megapixels in certain situations. Of course, it doesn't work in every situation. But if you're shooting slow, still life, landscapes that are still cityscapes, interiors, there's actually a lot of use cases where you can put a camera on a tripod and get up to 96 megapixels with this camera. And then the secret, secret weapon, well, that is XP7, giving us those extraordinary, exciting focus modes that we now have, the subject detection, which we can see with the latest iteration on the Z9, the 4.10, that Nikon is continuing to advance the XP7 cameras where it can. And the Z9 has just gotten a few features that only the Z8 had, and now the Z9 has some features that the Z8 doesn't have and vice versa. And this will keep going. And I don't see it to be any different for this camera and any other camera that comes before it. So that's part one of why this is a Trojan horse. It fits in anywhere, but it's a powerhouse and it can actually shoot any type of photography. Now, would you choose to shoot wildlife with this? Well, maybe not, but it can do it. And well, pretty much every other type of photography I think you can actually do it fine. And if you want to make it a little bit more ergonomic than it is straight out of the box, and then you grab the grip that's say from small rig. And I think Nikon even make their own one in some markets. Number one. Number two, Trojan horse. This is a really good indicator of what the future holds for all other Z cameras and what will happen in regards to XP7. Absolutely, this is a pointer. They've now given us the XP7 technology in a camera that's half the price of the most recent one, the Z8. We've gone from 4,000 US dollars 
down to 1,999 US dollars. This is significant. And of course, always with technology, as technology gets older, it gets cheaper. For example, if you look at an iPhone 13, they still make new ones, but it's got older technology in it and it's obviously getting cheaper. That processor gets cheaper. Well, if the Xpeed 7 is the same and all of the research and development has been finalized and amortized across the Z9 and the Z8, and you are producing these chips, they're the same chip, but technology keeps moving forwards, then by rights, the XP7 actually becomes cheaper and you can put it in lower and lower entry cameras as time passes. That is just the march of technology. Whether you want to see a new Z50, whether you want to see a new Z5, of course, new updates to the Z6 and the Z7, any of those cameras along with, and people asking for a higher end APS-C camera, all of these desires are absolutely valid. And I can only think that all of the cameras will get XP7. They've got to do this partially because of what their competition are doing, but also that's the platform. That's what they're developing. That's what the future is. And if that is the case, and I do think it will be, who knows, but if that is the case, wow. Do we have very exciting technology in store for these lower end cameras? Imagine a Z50 Mark II with XP7 in it, running super fast AF, maybe a slight increase in frame rates. And that becomes a ridiculously powerful camera that anybody can use from entry level enthusiasts up to birders. And it could all just be in a Z50. Or maybe, maybe there will be a higher end body. Who knows? Who knows whether it will be necessary if something like a Z50 Mark II simply becomes powerful enough. So Trojan horse number two is inside here, this is really telling us what the future of Z looks like. We've got so much of the Z8 and Z9 goodness inside of this camera, and this shows to us it can only trickle down and around further. Next Trojan horse is, well, essentially, this is the Z6 III, essentially, or it could have been. And for some people, this will be their Z6 III. For some people, they will be happy to take the technological advances over the Z6 II and the Z6, and the technological advancements are huge. It's, it's much faster, it's got the IBIS, it's got better light, it's got everything. I mean, everything is an advancement. And the only thing that I would consider not an advancement over the Z6 II is there is no CF Express Type B. But there you go. You still get two slots though, you still get redundancy. And if redundancy is an issue, it's here. I don't see that as a deal breaker. It depends, I suppose, on whether you're an enthusiast, a semi-pro, or a pro. But can I tell you, plenty of pros have been working with SD for years. So this could also satiate some potential Z6 III upgraders. And I know from my comments, there are a few that have gone in this direction. That's the next Trojan horse. And why else is this a Trojan horse, well, it's about other markets. It's about Nikon's competitors. It's about Leica. I suspect there could be some Leica users that would be interested in this. Now I get it. I get this is not a range finder experience and that is some of what some Leica users love. Fujifilm have made a massive business out of their retro cameras. Their APS-C line, almost all of them, except for the X-H2 and the X-H2S and others in that line, I think everything else, and please do let me know in the comments below if I'm wrong, I am not an expert on Fujifilm, everything else is retro or, or retro inspired in some way. I'm sure there are some Fujifilm users that might want to go beyond APS-C, but they don't want to go to small, medium format, which is what the GFX offers. They're big, and it's big glass. Personally, for me, I get very excited about that sort of stuff. I own a Hasselblad. But a lot of people don't want to go that far. And so 35mm, well, that might be the sweet spot. And again, since the launch of the ZF, I have seen a few people in my comments talking about the idea that, well, they're in both Nikon and Fuji, but this now may allow them to just be Nikon only, or, they're in Fuji and they're very seriously considering 
this as a full frame option. Now, Fuji has a lot of APS-C cameras around the 20 to 26 megapixel mark, but they're APS-C. This is 24 megapixels, it's full frame, it's 35 mil. So for those users, they're gonna get a very similar experience that they've been used to for a very long time, but now they can do it in 35 mil. So this is just another Trojan horse part of this equation. Is it gonna be a big change? Is it gonna be a big difference? Maybe. Maybe not, but if you're in Nikon shoes, your job is to expand your market. And if that means getting a tiny bit of Leica and a little bit of Fuji, absolutely everything helps. But what about Canon and Sony? Panasonic. Well, none of those brands have shown any interest in creating anything that looks like this. Cool, retro, fun. Sony kind of tries, but really they don't get anywhere close to it. We have the A7C2 and the A7CR, and they're little. Maybe you could call them cute. I don't think they're cute. I think for me and for many other users, they come across as being plasticky, which is probably true. Those bodies are made of some sort of composite, some sort of plastic, as opposed to this, which literally feels like a chunk of metal and all of this is metal, magnesium alloy. All of these dials are brass and Rishi showed us how you can buff them back and you can go back to that original look. So Canon and Sony, they're nowhere to be seen when it comes to 35 mil and this space. So there's another market. I can see some people, again, not all, but some people, and it doesn't matter if it's just half of 1%, if they're interested, that makes a big difference to any company's bottom line. And again, this camera does not just pack the looks, but it is a powerhouse of XP7 and all that XP7 brings for a 24 megapixel sensor. At this price point, at this price point, like it's really intriguing to me what we're now getting at this price point. And there's yet even another market, another Trojan horse market. And Joe talked about that in the video that we made a couple of weeks ago. You can check it out here, which is ZFC users. Plenty of people bought a ZFC, and then a lot of them said, well, why not a full frame one? And boom, here we are. So there are a lot of ZFC users like me who were just gonna automatically upgrade to a camera like this. Another massive market is also people like me, again, professionals who will either use this as a B or C camera in video, because this is a very competent 10-bit log video camera, 4K, 60, all that stuff. Very competent, awesome IBIS. So great for vloggers, and of course, vloggers, because we've got the flip out screen. Hello, something that people are just crazy desperate for. And there I am in full Technicolor. It's, it's great for people like me as, as a, B or C video camera, but also this can be a primary, secondary, or tertiary stills camera as well on any photo shoot, as long as 24 megapixels is what you need for that photo shoot. Again, this is just packing so much tech and it will work amazingly for documentary, event, photojournalism, weddings, lifestyle, travel, and on and on the list goes. Influencers, content creator, like content creator, this is a complete package for a content creator who's interested in looking cool, but also having state-of-the-art tech. Is there anyone else that does this in 35 mil? And the answer is no. And that's the final part about this being a Trojan horse. Nobody offers this look and this tech together in 35 mil with an extraordinary, like there's an extraordinary range of colors. They're all beautiful, all seven of them, including black, along with the extraordinary glass, which you can choose to upgrade to as you move on. And not only is there extraordinary glass in Z mount, like we just keep talking about it and more is coming, Sigma, Tamron, all of the Nikon stuff and the, the Viltrox and Miki and Lauer, Pergear, on and on it goes. There's just so much glass available and more and more seems to be being announced faster and faster. 
But then you've got to remember that this is the most adaptable mount of all mounts with autofocus, the most. So you can put on every Sony lens with an adapter. You can put on every F mount lens with an adapter. You can put on old Canon, not RF, but the previous EF Canon lenses with an adapter and so on. And there's just an almost Leica lenses and uh, Mamiya RB67 lenses. It's almost an endless list of glass that's available to all of us that can go on this camera. Stealth, it's, it's the Trojan horse, as I've said. It's for everybody. It's a powerhouse. It can shoot everything. It is affordable. This is a lot of tech at this price point. And people, anybody that might suggest to you that this is too expensive for what you get, they haven't used it yet. So there it is. It's an absolute Trojan horse. It's showing us where the future lies for more Z cameras. It's going to fit into so many markets, so many use cases, and it's going to potentially disrupt some of its competitors. This camera does so much for just one very affordable camera that, well, is just cool and, and really it's just a lot of fun. I'd love to know what you think of my ZF theories and why it is the ultimate Nikon Trojan horse in the 2020s. And if you're getting one, I'd love to know what color it is. And if you're not, what are you doing next? Are you holding on to what you've got? Or if you're not, what are you waiting for? As usual, it's been so good to see you. And please do let me know in the comments below, what do you think about the beautiful Sunset Orange? I love it. And if this is your first time here, I would love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like. And I have to say, this just has the most awesome click. And I feel like, I feel like the click has changed since my pre-production version. I don't know if that's possible, but I feel like it has. All right, I'll catch you later.